I get to see all of you at this uh, barbecue, the shindig. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Also, in the church app, you can listen to all the messages online. There's a podcast, so there's audio capacity on there. All right. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to understand the things that will be spoken. We thank you that you've given us your wisdom and your understanding, that we can uh, be taught the word of God from the Holy Spirit. And we're expecting that to happen today. In Christ's name, amen. So what we're going to talk about today is Psalm 23. And we're going to deal with the subject of how God restores the human soul, how God restores the human soul. And Psalm 23 is filled with a lot of pictures, metaphors, things that depict God's love and care for us. Um, it's just an amazing psalm, probably the most popular psalm that we have in the Bible and one of the most important in the Bible. And uh, it was written by David, and one of the things I like about David, King David, the greatest king of Israel, he was the second king after King Saul, is that David was very much in touch with his human soul. He was in touch with his emotions. So he was a very balanced person. He was an incredible man of war, uh, an amazing fighter. He was able to take down the greatest warrior in the Philistine army. At the same time, he was a great king, and at the same time, he was a great songwriter and psalmist. So he was a well-rounded person, a leader, a fighter, a thinker, a songwriter, a worshiper of God. And this psalm basically exemplifies uh, what he thought about God. It just summarizes his view of God. Now, with all the experiences that David has had, this is something that will speak to all of us, no matter what your background is, even if you were never called to be a king, uh, even if you're not a leader. Uh, the, this is amazing because David experienced betrayal from those closest to him, even his family. David was persecuted by his own spiritual father or leader who was jealous of him and his leader tried to kill him. Uh, he himself experienced great moral failure and let down his own people and his, and his own God. Um, he sought God and loved God even in spite of his failures. And this psalm shows us how he viewed God. And so no matter what you've been through, I'm sure all of us here have been wounded in life. Most, if not all, of us have been betrayed. Most, if not all, have had people who misunderstood us, who were jealous of us, who tried to hurt us, harm us, separate us from our uh, loved ones. Uh, maybe not all of us have been in the front lines of battle. Maybe some of you have. But uh, this, this, this psalm will speak to somebody. And so let's just look at the first verse of Psalm 23 to start off it says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want or I shall not lack or I shall not lack anything and so in that day and age it was mostly an agrarian culture so they spoke in terms and terminology and metaphors and pictures that depicted farming and shepherding uh, that kind of thing. It was before, obviously, way before the Industrial Revolution. That was almost 3,000 years later. So most people did not live in the cities at that point. And so he was describing God as his shepherd. And uh, shepherd was described because that's what David did for a living as he helped his father and his brothers out with the family business. So they owned many, many sheep and he was also a shepherd under his father. And so he, as he was in the shepherd's field, I'm sure he would pray and think about God and he would be able to connect how he cared for the sheep in the midst of many, many different circumstances that we'll see in this Psalm. Uh, he showed how God was the same way with him. 
And so when he says, I shall not want, uh, he took care of the sheep. He was somebody who would not allow the wolves or the lions or the bears to kill the sheep or attack or steal them. Uh, he was guiding them through every single uh, pasture or every single route, uh, whether it's a, a valley, a hill, uh, whether it was filled with grass, whether it was a desert ground. He was the one that protected the sheep. He was the one who brought them through all these different circumstances that they would experience. So when he said, I shall not want or I shall not lack, what he's saying is no matter what we go through in life, God is going to be there for us. God is going to provide for us. Whether it's financial lack, whether it's a physical lack, emotional, whatever it is, even divine healing, uh, God is there for us. And as we uh, serve the Lord, this is how we can experience God. This is not for every human being on the planet. It's for those who serve God, who are following God. Because the shepherd could only take care of those in his flock. He's not responsible for those not in his flock. Does that make sense? So if there's a sheep somewhere else, uh, or if it's not in the confines of his property, uh, that shepherd is not responsible or cannot help him. So when it says, I shall not lack anything or I shall not want, that implies that it's for those who are following the shepherd, those who are in his sheepfold. And then it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I like that, he makes me. Now, I don't know if that means that it was part of the routine that the shepherd followed to cause the sheep to go to green pastures, or if it literally means he forced them. In the Hebrew, it actually says make. So it could mean that he made them uh, lie down in green pastures. And so in looking how God looks at us and deals with us, sometimes God does compel us, almost force us to slow down, right? Uh, it could be circumstances, it could be a physical thing or whatever it is, but sometimes we're so out of whack, we violate our soul so much with our busyness and all the stress and the different things that go on in life that God has to step in and make us lie down. Isn't that amazing? He cares for us that much. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Green pastures imply that there, there is, a, when we're lying down, there's sufficient food to feed upon. There's sufficient provision for us as we're in this place. So there are some times in your life where you need a lot of space. That's normal. Look at this. He makes me lie down. There's some times in life where you need to be alone. Sometimes in life where you need to uh, be on vacation. You need to uh, carve out time for yourself. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, one of the things I see about this psalm is it's really focusing on the care God has for all of us as individuals. Now that's important because many of the passages in the Bible have to do with how we are operating in the context of either the nation of Israel, Old Testament, or the church, New Testament. Uh, a lot of these are corporate passages, which means that you can't really apply scripture if you're not in a church, even walking with God in the fullness, and walking in your purpose. But when it comes to this particular psalm, it does imply that the sheep are together, but it's individualizing it. It's talking about how God individually cares for each one of us. Uh, and so, it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So God will interrupt the rhythm of your life if you are not taking sufficient time to rest. He will interrupt the rhythm of your life. It could mean that, you know, you just can't go on anymore. There's sometimes I've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely on the edge more than I should be in my schedule. And uh, there are sometimes I'd fly back from being in Argentina or being back from Brazil or a long trip and immediately I go to work and a few times my mind shut down. I could not. It wasn't even physical. My mind couldn't work. It was like a, a brain freeze or it was like your computer for a prose and I said, oh boy, I can't do this. And it's gotten more like that in the last 10 years. So I have to learn that I'm not the same age I was. So I had to make a shift about 10 years ago 
and now I have to carve out time in between trips. I remember one time I was uh, ministering in, in one city after the next, and uh, I was just burned out because they, I would land, go preach, minister, then go to the next city, land, immediately preach. So I told the host, next year when you have me come back, I refuse to minister the same day I land in a new city. I will not minister till the next day. Next year, he had me land and go, and I'm not going. What do you mean? I said, I'm, I already told you, I'm not going. Oh, what about this? I don't care. I'll minister tomorrow. I put my foot down, because if you don't put your foot down, people will abuse you and use you. And uh, I, I think that my own life is more important than one meeting. So if you would listen to me, you wouldn't have made that plan to begin with. So that's your problem, not mine. Don't make your problem my problem, because it's not. So there's sometimes you have to put your foot down and carve out space for yourself. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Um, and so you know when that time is. And I know there are certain points in my life when I'm actually doing violence to my own emotions because of my schedule. And I know that I have to, at some point, the first chance I get, just carve out some time and just back off a little bit. And this next part, a part of the passage goes along with that. He leads me beside still waters. In the Hebrew, that's waters of rest. Someone say waters of rest. Waters of rest. So sometimes he makes you lie down, and he does lead you besides the waters of rest. Jesus said to take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so it doesn't mean that we're not called to work hard, but... We could work hard without violating our own life. I mean, there are some times where you can't help the schedule, but as soon as you can, you just have to do something. So when God is leading us, he leads us beside waters of rest. The word waters in scripture depict the Holy Spirit. So it's not just having a vacation or carving out time. You go on vacation, it could be the vacation from hell. Some vacations, you come back, you need a vacation from the vacation. So you can't depend on vacations. You have to depend on the Holy Spirit, waiting on God, having time with God. Waters of rest imply that this is how God leads us. We enter his rest. We walk in his presence. No matter where we are, even in the midst of hard work, we can still enter his rest, cease from our own labors, enter his rest, and have the Holy Spirit empowering us and giving us soul rest. And then right after that, verse 3, after he says, he leads me beside the still waters. I don't know, there's something about water that's medicinal, isn't it? I just love, I, I had to live near water. Uh, so in Bay Ridge, we're only a few blocks away, so I could just go bike riding or walk right near, you know, right off the pier over there. Uh, water, the, the sound of water, of waves, when you're sleeping at night, uh, it's just amazing, isn't it? There's something about water. And that's how God planned it. So he leads us beside the still waters. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, God leads us in those periods of our life. And then it says that he restores my soul. Wow. What does that mean? Your soul has to do with your emotions. has to do with your thoughts, your feelings. It has to do with your will, your intellect. So your soul has all of these elements of what gives us self-consciousness and what makes us a human. That differentiates us, uh, self-awareness part, from animals. Uh, they do have souls, but they don't have self-awareness of the consciousness that we have. And so it says that he restores my soul. Again, that implies that we violate our soul. When we're holding on to anger and bitterness, when we're constantly under stress, when our own life is in a bad place, uh, when we have disappointed ourselves or others have disappointed us and we fall into depression, discouragement, fear, anxiety, when we don't resolve issues, especially relational issues, and we keep pushing them down and they keep piling up, eventually, no matter how hard you try, your subconscious pours and spills over into the conscious realm, and your, your soul is a mess. Many of us here today, there's a lot of woundedness and brokenness. 
we are physically walking, but there's a lot of broken pieces and places. And even though you may look very healthy and strong physically inside, there's a lot of broken pieces and live wires and issues that you haven't dealt with. And you need to let God restore your soul. You need to let God, because if you don't let God restore your soul, then your false self, the not the true you, but a you that's hurt, angry, bitter, broken, resentful, has a chip on its shoulder, uh, wants to prove itself, wants to be revengeful and spiteful, wants to hurt, maim, injure others, has bad feelings inside. That is the self that is going to be projected within you and to others. Even if you try to manage it, it's still going to come out. And so God wants to restore your soul, the true you, the true self. And that can only be done by God's help. Uh, Jesus came not only as God but as man because he wanted to restore our humanity. It's not just about going to heaven. It's not just about the Holy Spirit. It's not just about our spirit. It's about our humanity enjoying life, having healthy relationships, having a full life, having healthy thoughts, having a good attitude in life, being positive, having a sense of purpose, having a sense of God's love, having a sense of, of understanding uh, what you're supposed to be doing in this world. He's restoring your soul. That means he cares about your emotions. He doesn't want us walking around in fear and anxiety uh, in depression and self-pity and having pity parties all the time. Uh, he wants to restore our soul. And some of us have never experienced the true us. When God became human, he came not only to show who God was, but to help restore our particular humanity, our true self. And I love that about God. I love that. And because we're made in God's image, we will never, ever know ourselves unless we get to know God experientially. We're made in his image, so you can't know yourself until you know God and dive into and plumb the depths of God's being and pouring over his word and being in church and hearing the word of God. So for those of you who want your soul restored, you can't have your soul restored unless you go to the reference point for humanity, and that's God who made us in his own image. And then it says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So one of the ways that our soul is restored is we follow him. We follow his ways as shown in the word of God. So there are paths of righteousness, which means by implication there are paths of wickedness. There are paths of disobedience. There are paths in which it's like Frank Sinatra, I did it my own way. Well, that's not good if it's not God's way. A lot of us take pride in carving out our own life, but if it's not the life God has called you to live, then I wouldn't be proud of it because you're actually hurting yourself and you'll never fulfill your purpose. And so the paths of righteousness are ways that God has called out for you to walk in your purpose and also to walk in a way that pleases him. And so if you're not walking in the paths of righteousness, you can't claim all these other things. We want our cake and eat it too. We want to have a healthy soul, healthy body. We want to have fulfillment. We want to have that. But we want to do it our way. No, you can't. It's paths of righteousness. That's the condition. You have to walk in those paths of righteousness. It doesn't mean that you're sinless. It means that there's a way, a pattern of life that you're living that, it, that pleases God. And then he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. In these paths of righteousness are valleys. It's not only mountains. When you follow God, it doesn't mean everything's going to go good. It doesn't mean that you're always going to see the sunshine. Sometimes you're walking in such a deep valley, the, the uh, valley uh, does not have the sun shining on it. The mountains are blocking the sun. And so in those kind of situations, you have to really depend upon God. Because God does lead us into valleys. There are emotional highs and lows we go through, of course. 
but I believe this is also talking about times of testing. It's talking about times when we can't see the light, times when we are in relational conflict, times when there are situations that we can't explain or things that are very, very difficult in our life. And we all go through that and we all, some of us live in that for many, many years. And so he's saying that the path of righteousness includes valleys. It's not just mountains. I'd love to stay on top of a mountain. I'd love to have a church service continually, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where we're praising God, fellowshipping, we love each other, we have all that. But then Monday, you have to go to work. You have to deal with that boss or that employee. You have to deal with the trains, planes, automobiles. You have to deal with weather. You have to deal with financial lack. You have to deal with issues with others, with issues with spouses and children and people. Yeah, there's a lot of that that goes on. But you know what? It's not necessarily that you're out of God's will. He leads you in valleys, not just in mountains. And he says that some of these valleys are so deep, it says they're called the valley of the shadow of death. But he says, in the midst of that, I will fear no evil. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they come from me. What is the shepherd's rod and staff? In the darkness, they knew they weren't alone because they, when they started straying, they would feel the gentle staff hitting them, touching them or just guiding them the right way. Sometimes it also implies correction. In the midst of our darkness, we may not act the best, but God will correct us, and whom the Lord loves, he corrects. If he doesn't correct you, then he doesn't love you. So when God disciplines you, when he whips you behind, know that it's a good thing. Someone say it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I don't like it, but I know it's good for me. Uh, I remember my dad would, uh, no, that wasn't my dad, it was when I was in school, they would, you know, I, I'm a little older than most of you, so when I was in school, they spanked us, and uh, now they get all thrown in jail, but uh, I remember i bring something, i put it in my underwear, so that it would protect me, but they saw through it, and they, get that out of here, go to the bathroom, so, you know, uh, when God corrects us, he chastises us, it's always done in love, it's never in anger, and it's always to restore us, not to uh, embarrass us or shame us. There's a difference between how Satan operates and how God operates. God convicts us, the devil condemns us. Whenever you feel condemned and you want to isolate yourself from the people around you, the church and everybody else, that's not God. Um, when it's out of shame and convict, uh, when it's uh, condemnation. God convicts us, gently convicts us. And it's the kindness of God who leads us to repentance. And so, in the midst of this valley, in this shadow, we fear no evil. His staff, his rod, is there and comforts us. I like that. The rod of God is not only to protect us in terms of guiding us, but it's to fight the lions, to fight the wolves, and to fight those bears. I don't know how David did it, but David killed the lion and the bear uh, before he met Goliath. Maybe he used the rod with the bear, I don't know how he did it, but, uh, but that was also used as a weapon. And so God will deal with those that you can't deal with. He said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And at the end of the day, we're called to walk in love and if there's something that we can't handle, he'll handle it. He'll handle it as long as we trust him. Isn't that good? Oh, yeah. So he goes before us. He goes before the paths that he's laid out for us. And the next verse shows uh, how we're supposed to be. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's amazing. Shepherd would take the sheep to a certain mountaintop and it was called a table where there was a lot of grass and actually looked like a table from far away and they would be able to just feast on this grass and it was in the presence of the enemies the wolves weren't incredibly far away and other predators but that shepherd was there and those sheep did not care about wolves because they knew the shepherd was near God didn't call you to be far away from your enemies he called you to be in the presence of your enemies he called you to be face-to-face -face with them. 
with his power. We are never going to live in a world where everyone's a believer of Christ. There's going to be political differences, ideological differences, relational differences. There's going to be personality conflicts. There's going to be a lot of things, people with wrong motives. And yes, there are wicked people. I'm not one of those who believe that everybody's good. No, everybody is not good. A lot of people do not have good intentions, good motives. But God doesn't say, I'm going to put you in a bubble somewhere. No, the strength of our God is that you can actually serve him in the midst of your enemies. Not only serve him, but feast. Don't worry. Eat. Have what you need. God gives us a provision even when we're in the midst of our enemies. Isn't that a great thing? So our God is so powerful. Christianity is so practical and powerful that you don't need to be in a cave somewhere as a hermit to follow God. You follow God in the midst of the warfare and the battle and in the midst of life, just life. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. Jesus said that. Jesus said, in the world, you will. He promised us, have tribulation. But then he said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Christianity is in a world without differences and problems. Even in the church, you're going to have these things. It's a world in which God promises us that we will be able to have provision in the midst of our conflicts. A table in the presence of my enemies. And he says, you anoint my head with oil. Uh, what happens was the, the bugs would just eat those poor sheep right on the top of their head, almost eat them alive. And the shepherd would just put some kind of anointing oil on the head in order to protect it, in order to heal it, in order to insulate uh, the head from all these, these bugs that were just eating them. And so God does the same thing with us. The word anoint also implies the Holy Spirit. So he says he anoints my head. What does your head represent? That's my thoughts. God wants to anoint my thoughts. That's my emotions. My head, that's my will. Everything God wants to empower. He wants to empower my will. He wants to give me courage. He wants to give me good thoughts. He wants to take away fear. He wants to anoint my head, my thinking, my thoughts. He wants to give me the mindset of Christ. He wants me to think God's thoughts after him. He wants me to be able to view life the way he does, to perceive life the way he does. He also wants to give me discernment, meaning to see past the, the superficial uh, things that people are giving us, to see past the, 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 the plasticness of the world. He wants us to have discernment, to see deep into what is really right and wrong, what's really true. You can't believe everything you read in the media. You have to see past the surface of things. What is underneath the visible iceberg is 90% of that ice. You just see 10% as big as that iceberg is. Most people are just living uh, above the sur surface. God is calling us to go beneath the surface. That's why John said, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. You could just cut off the, the branches and the tree will keep growing. You cut the root off, that's when the tree dies. God anoints our head with oil, gets to our motives, our thoughts, empowers us with the power of the Spirit, and gives us faith. And then he says, and my cup overflows. God doesn't want to just provide your needs. He wants to give you a lot more than you need. He wants you to have an abundant life. He doesn't want you just to try to survive. He wants you to thrive. He doesn't just want you to try to live uh, you know, a happy life as much as you can. He wants you to be joyful in the midst of tribulation. He wants our cup to overflow. That means that I'd only, I don't just have enough of God for myself. I have enough to give to many others. If all you have is a full cup, you can only drink for yourself. God wants your cup to overflow so that you can feed, so that you can give others uh, a, a drink, so that those who are thirsty around you, that's what Jesus uh, meant when he said in John 7, those who are thirsty around us can drink. He said, those who believe out of the innermost part of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so the Christian life is an abundant life. It's a joyful life. 
It's a life of meaning, a life of significance, a life of fulfillment. It's never a life without problems or without valleys or without darkness. But it's a life that is promised to be a purposeful life because God is with you in the midst of every situation and circumstance. And then he ends it by saying, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God is good, but it's not talking just about God following him. When he says, goodness and mercy shall follow me, that means that God himself will providentially orchestrate your circumstances so that no matter how bad it is, no matter how dark it is, no matter how deep the valley, it's going to work out for good. If you stay on the path of righteousness, God said, goodness and mercy shall follow you. In the beginning, beginning, it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look that good. But if it always looked good, how would you be tested? How would we know what we really believe? How would we grow in our faith? How would we know if we're really trusting God? If it's always good, then how in the world are we going to be challenged? It would be like someone going to the gym. You could bench press 300 pounds, but every time you went to the gym, you bench pressed 100 pounds. You're never going to get stronger. You only grow by being challenged, by resistance. And so he says, goodness shall follow me. That means that in front, in the front end, it doesn't always look good. But God works it out for good if you trust him and don't give up. Goodness and mercy. Mercy means that when I mess up, even if I don't follow it the way I should 100%, but as long as I get back on track. Now, David was a, a man after God's own heart, even though he fell into some grievous sins. But because he was a man after God's heart, mercy followed him. And Christianity is not for the perfect, it's for the forgiven. And we all need forgiveness, because we're all going to mess up. I mean, understand that. We're all going to mess up. Maybe some of you have been messing up big time and you came to church anyway and I applaud you for that because mercy follows you all the days of your life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Hebrew, it's for the length of my days. Meaning, you're always going to have a place in God's family. The house of the Lord is a metaphor for His family. You know, Heaven begins when we come to Christ. That's eternal life. We have a glimpse, a taste of it inside of our hearts. When you pass from this life, you immediately and seamlessly transition into the next life. You may not even know that you die when you die. The consciousness is just going to be so instant. That's why Jesus said that those who live and believe in me shall never taste death. That's John 11. You're not going to experience, you're not even going to realize. You're just going to go from the physical to, wow, spiritual realm. And what God is saying here is forever, you're going to be in his family. You may transition from the earth to heaven, but you will always remain in his family if you are one of his sheep and believe in him. Let's pray. have the worship team come up. Thank you, God. Lord, we thank you that you are our shepherd. And we will lack nothing. That you make us lie down in green pastures. That you lead us beside the waters of rest. And you restore our soul. That you lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We thank you that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. We feel with us. Your rod and your staff comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil and our cup overflows. We thank you that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell 
in the house of the Lord forever. I'm wondering, before we go today, is there anyone who would say, Pastor, I, I need prayer. I want to make sure I'm one of his sheep. I want to be in his fold. 